A new Russian scandal and a former president has resurfaced to criticize the current occupant of the Oval Office. Former Deputy Assistant to President Trump, Dr. Sebastian Gorka is here with analysis. And later, pro football players continue to protest during the national anthem and fans are abandoning the NFL in droves. Former NFL player turned pastor Ed Tandy McGlasson is here to give us his take on the situation. Finally, how did a missionary trip to Africa lead to the discovery of a lifelong calling and transform the life of Katie Davis Majors? She will tell us and share her new book, Daring to Hope. The World Over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Dr. Sebastian Gorka, Ed Tandy McGlasson, and Katie Davis Majors. A lot of three-named folks straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. I'll be live tweeting throughout the show. Or you can email us at worldover at EWTN.com. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. President Donald Trump and Capitol Hill Republicans have taken their first step toward a $1.5 trillion tax cut and reform plan. On Thursday, Senate Republicans succeeded in passing a non-binding budget plan. Now, that measure allows the GOP-led Congress to follow up with a vote on tax reform in the coming months without the threat of a Democrat filibuster. During a speech at the Heritage Foundation earlier this week, the president said the plan would boost economic growth, create jobs, and lead to a $4,000 pay raise for the average American family. He called on Congress to give massive tax relief as a Christmas present to the country. He then turned his attention to, well, Christmas. Speaking, I just, you know, I'm talking about Christmas present. I'll give you a bigger Christmas present. You're going to be saying Merry Christmas again, okay? I'm going to say Merry Christmas. You know? You go to the stores, and they have the red walls, and they have the snow, and they even have the sleigh, and the whole thing. They don't have Merry Christmas. They don't have Merry Christmas. I want them to say, Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy New Year, happy holidays, but I want Merry Christmas. Yep. Merry Christmas. Turning to the fight against ISIS, U.S.-backed forces in Syria have liberated the city of Raqqa from Islamic State militants, a major defeat to the collapsing jihadi group. Just three years ago, ISIS had proclaimed Raqqa the capital of its caliphate. Although the Middle East appears to have overcome the Islamic State's territorial dominance, after the liberation of Mosul and now Raqqa, ISIS is still a dangerous presence. An estimated 6,500 jihadists remain in parts of central and eastern Syria and in Iraq's sprawling Anbar province. This past weekend, a massive truck bomb killed over 300 people and wounded 400 more in the Somali capital of Mogadishu. Scores more remain missing and are feared trapped under mounds of rubble. The jihadi terror group Al-Shabaab is the likely suspect in the bombing. On Wednesday, thousands took to the streets of Mogadishu in protest after the deadliest terror attacks in that country's history. Somalis are calling the bombing their 9-11 and are asking why such a deadly attack isn't drawing more global attention. Al-Shabaab, a known ally of Al-Qaeda, has yet to claim responsibility for the attack. Despite the terror presence in Syria, Somalia, and four other Muslim-majority countries, two U.S. courts have blocked enforcement of President Donald Trump's latest travel ban. This is the third version of the Trump executive order that was set to take effect on Wednesday. The ban was directed at Chad, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Syria, Yemen, as well as North Korea and Venezuela. A federal judge in Maryland and another in Hawaii ruled that the ban discriminates against Muslims. The ruling did not block travel bans for North Korea or Venezuela. U.S. District Court Judge Theodore Chuang in Maryland said the president's own statements proved that he intended to effectuate a partial Muslim ban. 
Judge Derek Watson in Hawaii ruled that the ban plainly discriminates based on nationality. The Trump administration has denied that the order is a Muslim ban, calling it a public safety measure to fight terrorism. Both judges were appointees of President Barack Obama. And a federal judge has ruled that the Trump administration must allow a pregnant 17-year-old immigrant detained after entering the U.S. illegally to have an abortion. After a brief hearing that included a testy exchange with government lawyers, Judge Tanya Chutkin ordered the government to promptly and without delay transport the teenager to the nearest abortion clinic. Government lawyers argued that the teen who is 15 weeks pregnant is free to return to her home country and seek an abortion there, and that the U.S. shouldn't be required to facilitate abortions for illegal aliens. The judge argued that illegal immigrants in federal custody receive medical treatment and questioned why an abortion should be any different. The Department of Health and Human Services issued a statement calling Wednesday's ruling troubling. It is considering ways to ensure that the U.S., quote, does not become an open sanctuary for taxpayer-supported abortions for minors crossing the border illegally, end quote. And the U.S. Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals has ruled that a World War I memorial that has stood in Maryland for 92 years is unconstitutional. Known as the Peace Cross, the memorial stands 40 feet tall and honors the 49 men from Prince George's County who died in the Great War. In a two-to-one decision, the judges said the publicly maintained structure has the primary effect of endorsing religion. The American Humanist Association applauded the ruling, saying the cross endorses Christianity and ignores non-Christian veterans. The American Legion, who built the memorial back in 1925, plans to appeal to the Supreme Court. And Pope Francis is calling for world governments to fight hunger by ending armed conflicts and climate change-related disasters. The Pope received a standing ovation for his remarks at the UN's World Food Day in Rome. Francis cited the Paris Climate Accord as a concrete example of world leaders taking action to battle global warming, a problem that he says forces people from their homes in search of food. In an apparent jab at the United States, the Pope lamented that some governments are unfortunately distancing themselves from the Paris Accord. Francis went on to call population control a false solution to the problem of world hunger, instead urging better management of the planet's abundant resources. And the bishops of Poland are affirming the Church's traditional teaching on communion for the remarried. An Italian daily has published excerpts from an unreleased document by the bishops on Pope Francis's Amoris Laetitia. In it, the Polish bishops pledge to appoint clergy with a special role of accompanying people who have separated from their spouses. The priests are encouraged to carry out careful discernment to distinguish between different kinds of irregular situations and to make sure that nobody feels excluded. The Polish bishops have reaffirmed the church teaching of not admitting to Holy Communion divorced people who have remarried without an annulment. They cited Pope St. John Paul II's Familius Consortio, writings of Pope Benedict XVI, and the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith's 1994 letter to bishops as justification for their new policy. The Polish bishops also follow previous popes in saying that if the couples in irregular situations cannot separate but resolve to live as brother and sister, they may possibly receive the Eucharist when scandal is avoided. On Monday, the Senate confirmed Callista Gingrich, friend and frequent guest of this program, to serve as U.S. ambassador to the Vatican. The vote was 70 to 23. Democrats were split on the vote. Minority leader Chuck Schumer was among those who voted with all Senate Republicans in favor of the confirmation. Gingrich, wife of former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich, serves as the CEO of Gingrich Productions. She's an author, filmmaker, and former congressional aide. Calista is also a longtime member of the choir at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception here in D.C. Newt Gingrich attributes his conversion to Catholicism to Callista's witness to the faith. No word yet on when she will be received by Pope Francis to present her credentials. 
we congratulate the new ambassador. When we return, there are new details on a Russia investigation, and they do not involve the president. Dr. Sebastian Gorka joins us to discuss the world over. Continues in a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the world over. The president has been accused of lacking compassion during a call to the widow of a fallen U.S. soldier. And President George W. Bush has come out of retirement, and he seems to be critiquing President Trump. With analysis, I'm joined by intelligence expert and former deputy assistant to the president, Dr. Sebastian Gorka, returns to the program. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Raymond. I want to get right into this. Uh, George W. Bush addressed a forum on freedom, free markets, and security in New York City Thursday, organized by his Bush Institute. And he took aim at President Trump's border security and to limit levels of legal migration. Just listen to this. The American dream of upward mobility seems out of reach for some who feel left behind in a changing economy. Discontent deepened and sharpened partisan conflicts. Bigotry seems emboldened. Our politics seems more vulnerable to conspiracy theories and outright fabrication. Now, that, that takes a lot of doing for President Bush to talk about fabrication, weapons of mass destruction, anyone. But your are, are take on fabricate Fabrication, like the Russian collusion delusion, that kind of fabrication mm. from the left? Uh, I'm really disheartened. I was never a huge fan uh, of our former president. Um, but he seems to be in a competition, in a race with Senator McCain for who can be more irrelevant and who can be more wrong. We've just come out of eight years in which the White House drove the division. They looked at us solely upon our, based upon our skin color, our ethnic background, our sexual preference, our social class. None of this applies to the president. And I say this again and again, hand on heart. If we had a Bible here, I'd swear on it. There isn't a racist bone in President Trump's body. And if you go to the Trump rallies, these aren't people who divide us. They are these are people who want to come together. So I, I'm very disappointed in, in former President mm. Bush. You, particularly since you've left the employee of the White House, you have championed a nationalist message, mm. populist <laughs> message. You and Steve Bannon, whom I know you work closely with. Mm. President Bush had something to say about your brand, I think, of nationalism. Watch. We've seen nationalism distorted into nativism. We've forgotten the dynamism that immigration has always brought to America. We see a fading confidence in the value of free markets and international trade, forgetting that conflict, instability, and poverty follow in the wake of protectionism. Is this what you and President Trump and Steve Bannon are engaged in? Protectionism and what the president called, President Bush, uh, a distorted nativism. Uh, we are into protectionism, protectionism of American interests and American workers and American families. Uh, the immigration moratorium actually was motivated by national security concerns to protect our countries from the kinds of attacks we've seen in Europe. And also, think about this, Raymond. We want to protect the most vulnerable members of our society, because if you have hordes of illegal migrants coming in working for cash, who do they affect? Not you, not me, not the white-skinned Catholics living in northern Virginia or D.C. They attack the, the, the bottom-earning uh, individuals on the bottom rung of the earnings uh, scale, and, and this is what we're trying to protect. The the president wants you to prosper, whoever you are, whether you voted for him or not. And really, can we spend less time on former presidents? No, I've got to, I've got to play this one more bite for you because <laughs> okay. this is about, it really speaks to what you're talking about, limiting migration mm -hmm. and, and immigration. I know you and the president say we're doing this because we need to protect the country. President Bush says you have an isolationist sentiment. Watch. We've seen the return of isolationist sentiments. Forgetting that American security is directly threatened by the chaos and despair of distant places. Our security and prosperity are only found in wise, sustained global engagement, in the cultivation of new markets for American goods, in the confrontation of security challenges before they fully materialize and arrive on our shores. 
What is wrong with wise, sustained global engagement? It seems President Bush wants to have more adventures in the Middle East to stem and stop terrorism <laughs> abroad because it threatens the homeland. You would say what? So what's happened in the last eight months is has President Trump locked himself up in the Oval Office? He's traveled to the heart of the Muslim world. He's traveled to Rome. He's, he's uh, about to go to Asia to talk to our partners in Asia. Let's be a little, it's a little technical, but let's be specific here. We aren't isolationists supporting the president, nor is the president. We are non-interventionists. Mm. To put it more bluntly, enough of the dumb wars. And to have President Bush lecture us about being isolationist, maybe he should have been a little bit more isolationist when he was president and we wouldn't have the disaster of the WMDs and everything else. Mm. I want to move on to this Russia investigation, not the one we've been hearing about throughout the last year or so, yes. about collusion between the Trump administration, which uh, doesn't seem to be, be able, they, they can't <laughs> pin it on anybody. Funny that. In the, well, but they're looking. The, the investigation goes on. There's another Russian story. Yes. Collusion, the real, the real Russian story. Collusion between the Clintons, mm -hmm. who were apparently the beneficiaries via the Clinton Foundation mm -hmm. of millions of dollars from Russian interests, mm -hmm. and there was a undercover agent for the FBI mm -hmm. who made the payments on yes. behalf of these Russian interests. He had all this information. The FBI knew about it. Why are we just hearing about this now, Sebastian Gorka? Because Hillary Clinton didn't win the election. That's why. This is, this is the story. This makes Watergate look like a, a spat in the kindergarten. Uh, we have to doff our cap. Uh, Sarah Carter uh, at Circa has done amazing work to unearth actual pay for play. Literally millions of dollars mm -hmm. going into the hands of the Clinton family, Bill himself, half a million dollars. In speeches. In speeches from the Russian company involved in the uranium deal. And then pay off, kickbacks to uh, companies in the U.S. freighting the uranium and then donations to the Clinton Foundation. Th this is corruption in its worst form. This is the swamp. Mm -hmm. And hopefully somebody's going to go to prison. Yeah, well, and Hillary Clinton was on the board, we should say, yes. of the group that determined whether the Russians would get the uranium or not. She had to sign off. And they got the uranium. And they got 20% of America's uranium, which is a national security asset. What are the threats of other countries possessing that uranium? Do you think it might have made its way into the hands of the Iranians or the North Koreans or other interests? I, I'm, look, uh, in Russia, nothing happens without Vladimir Putin's say so, especially at geostrategic levels. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm pretty sure this went straight into the coffers of, of the Russians, and they're exploiting it mercilessly for their own <laughs> weapons programs and their own energy programs. Uh, mm. Amazing. Yeah, uh, let's move on to Steve Bannon, mm -hmm. your colleague. Uh, he was in Arizona this week, mm -hmm. stumping for Kelly Ward. Uh, the challenger of Senator Jeff Flake in Arizona. He had this to say, went right after Senator Mitch McConnell, the leader in the Senate. Watch. The last couple of days, Mitch has been saying this big thing. Hey, you got to win. You know, uh, winners make policy, losers go home. Hey, Mitch, note to self, Mitch, Big Luther Strange and little Bobby Corker are both going home. Your folks are going home. Their folks are going to make policy. And guess what, Mitch? It's going to be the policy of the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump, not what you want to do. Sebastian Gorka, is it wise to target the leader of the Senate and incumbents who the President needs to move legislation, legislation that has been stalled in the last few months? Uh, let me reply with a question. What has Mitch McConnell done for this President in the last nine months? He, he, what does he, he produce? He allowed his wife to be on the cabinet. <laughs> she's, the tra she's the transportation secretary. What, what, what has he done in terms of Obamacare? What has he done in terms of tax reform? What has he done at all for this new president? Um, Mitch McConnell looked very worried in that Rose Garden uh, impromptu presser two days ago, yeah. and rightly yeah, so. November the 8th was about making America great again, not making the GOP grave again. Mm. Well, you, the president and Mitch McConnell strained to put on, you know, kind yes. of the odd the couple did, face did of unity. He did a good job. And he even said, when asked about what Steve Bannon was doing, he said, well, look, I'm not going to back. I may not, I don't endorse that entirely. He kind of backed away from what Steve was saying. You, when you look at these races and you burrow down, when you look at the polls for Roy Moore, for instance, uh, who oof, Steve... Who very Steve, questionable polls. Okay, but Steve Bannon supported Roy yes, Moore. Yes, so did I. He scooped I Luther campaigned Strange. for Judge Moore. Okay, that's right. You were there at that right. rally as well. Right. 
Roy Moore is right now at four points. He's four points up above his competitor. Mm -hmm. Traditionally in Alabama, I lived there for a while. GOP candidates win by 20 percent will. or more. He will. Uh, the, the president took two thirds of the votes in Alabama. This last poll is, is an outlier. It's, it's on, based upon bad methodology. I was there. I was in the room. I campaigned. Think about one metric. Mm -hmm. Mitch McConnell's PAC spent $32 million on Luther mm -hmm. Strange. Judge Moore spent $2.4 million. Who won? Mm. Judge Moore. Okay. Let's move on. Congresswoman Frederica Wilson, I have to get to this. She claimed that President Trump told the widow of a U.S. serviceman killed in Niger that, quote, he knew what he signed up for, but I guess it still hurts. Trump denied the claim. And earlier today, General John Kelly, the White House Chief of Staff, had this to say, a very moving moment in the White House press room. Watch. I was stunned when I came to work yesterday morning and brokenhearted at what I saw a member of Congress doing. A member of Congress who listened in on a phone call from the President of the United States to a young wife and in his way tried to express that opinion. That he's a brave man, a fallen hero. He knew what he was getting himself into because he enlisted. There's no reason to enlist. He enlisted. And he was where he wanted to be, exactly where he wanted to be with exactly the people he wanted to be with when his life was taken. That was the message. That was the message that was transmitted. It stuns me that a member of Congress would have listened in on that conversation. Absolutely stuns me. And I thought at least that was sacred. What General Kelly also implied during his statement was that General Kelly advised the president on what to say, that these were things people told him and that consoled the families that yeah. he had spoken with. Raymond, uh, I wasn't on that call, but I know exactly what the president said because I have heard him say it dozens of times. I have heard it said by him to 18 Green Berets I brought into the Oval Office. He says every time, your sacrifice, your commitment is all the more astounding and to be revered because you did this voluntarily. You chose this way of life. You weren't a hero by accident because of circumstance. Mm -hmm. You volunteered. That's what the president said and that this congresswoman uses a death of one of our soldiers for her own political profit is disgraceful. But General Kelly was masterful today. He was awesome in the original sense of the word. It was awe-inspiring, and he set the record straight. Very quickly, uh, your thoughts on the media narrative on this, which is the president opened up this can of worms by saying other presidents didn't call the, the, our, our war dead. The narrative, I spoke to several journalists on, on the left recently, mm -hmm. And I asked them one question. I said, so by covering this story the way you have, you are positing the following. You are positing that a serving commander in chief rang up a widow or a gold star mother and said, ha, ha, well, he signed up for it, didn't he? Mm. Really? In your soul? That's what you believe the president did? Because if you don't believe it, then that's the most cynical, propagandist approach to journalism possible. And those are your two options. Wow. Um, you're, why do you think we're hearing so much about the Russian matter, this Russian collusion story that just seems to be mo a moving target, right. uh, and things like this? What are we not hearing? Well, we're hearing about lies because they have to avoid discussing the actual facts. What has the president done in nine months? We've just broken. I made a mistake. I was on Fox Business earlier in the week, and I said, we've broken the 27th stock market record. The host said, no the 47th stock market record. The stock market has increased by 24% in value since the inauguration. We've decreased illegal migration by 78%. Uh, more than a million jobs created. NATO has made a commitment to finally pay 2% of their GDP on defense. Mm -hmm. the, the list goes on and on and on. But if you talk about the facts, well, then you'll have to give the credit to somebody. And it's not going to be Hillary Clinton. It's not going to be the DNC. It has to be President Trump. That's why you're not hearing it, Ray. Before I let you go, there was this big story this week. Federal panel, the Fourth Circuit, invalidated. They're saying that a war memorial built 92 years ago, World War I memorial in Bladensburg, Maryland, not far from where we sit yeah. tonight, that needs to come down. It's unconstitutional and must be destroyed. Your thoughts? 
<laughs> uh, I'll just quote my former boss. Uh, I spoke at the uh, FRC summit at the weekend, and so did he, so did Steve. And he said, Merry Christmas. <laughs> We're pushing back on the culture war, whether it's memorials, whether it's celebrating our faith at the right season. So uh, watch out, you SWJ culture warriors, because there's a different wind blowing through this city. And uh, President Trump is blowing it the most. We'll continue to watch. Sebastian Gorka, thank, thank you for you. being here. When we return, as NFL players continue to take a knee, my next guest is asking them to do something more. Former NFL lineman Ed Tandy Glasson is here, and he'll tell us all about it when the world over continues. Stay right there. Uh, I would tell you that our players are men of great character. They have a, a very deep understanding and tremendous knowledge of the issues that are going on in all of our communities. Uh, and their commitment uh, to addressing these issues uh, is really admirable. We did not ask for that, sir. Welcome back to the World Over Live. That was NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell at a press conference earlier this week. What is going on with these NFL players, and how does a lack of father figures in our society shape this story? Joining me now is former NFL offensive lineman for the Rams, Jets, and Giants, and now pastor and founder of the Blessings of the Father Ministries. Welcome to the program, Ed Tandy McGlasson from our Orange County studio. Thank you for being here. Great being with you, Raymond. Ed, when you hear Goodell saying that he has not asked these players to stand for the anthem, when last week he noted that it's in the rule book, what do you make of this? Is this just fear of players, owners in the NFL collapsing to the, the will of a few players? You know, it's a complicated issue. And see, the truth of the matter is that uh, probably at some point in the life of a lot of players, maybe not all that are taking a knee, is we got a huge problem in our world right now. According to Blankenshorn, who's a sociologist, 51 percent of the kids in our country are going to go to bed without a father in their home. You imagine the impact. See, God's, you know what's interesting to me is why did God put this identity piece into guys to give to families? Hmm. I mean, if you would have given it to mom, they're always there. Mm -hmm. Moms are building relationship, but he put that inside of us guys in that you probably notice this, Raymond, in your own family with your kids, mm -hmm. your, your look and the way you speak to your kids, the way you love them, mm -hmm. I mean, really helps frame their life. And imagine your three kids that you have right now without you and their story, where would they be? Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what's happening in our world. It's, it, it's everywhere. And yeah. unfortunately, and it's why I wrote the piece in yeah, Fox you wrote an News, open letter. You wrote an open letter about... to all these NFL players. And I want to get to the letter in a minute because I really want you to plunge into it. But before we move to that, because I do think it's connected, as you're suggesting, as a former NFL player yourself, is the field the right place to take a stand or protest against something you believe is right or wrong, even though the rule book clearly says you can't do it? Do you support these players kneeling? You know what? Um... I, I put it this way. My dad was killed in action at 400 miles an hour. He was a test pilot for the Navy. Hmm. And I remember in my day when the national anthem came up, it was a time to remember every one of those people that went before us in battle. Hmm. And I would, I would never, ever take a knee during that time. There's very appropriate places, but you got to realize a lot of these players are being used by the political pundits of the day for their purposes. And guess what happens hmm when they're no longer fat enough or strong enough or healthy enough to play, they're never going to be called again. Mm -hmm. They're being used right now. And, I, and the reason I wrote that piece yeah, tell is me about I don't the think these letter. guys maybe understand. Well, see, you know, when I played football, there was probably four out of ten guys on my team who didn't have a father in their story. And, you know, a dad, when he's present in the home, is kind of like the, the studs in the house, right? Mm. They're the walls. They're the limitations. 
when a dad's speaking life and he's living a, a real a godly life out loud, those sons and those daughters, they have incredible security. Mom's like the artwork, right? She's the beauty. She's uh, the relationship glue in a family. But you remove that dad and you remove those structures, it creates this gigantic question mark in, in the heart of those sons. Mm -hmm. And so now, note that we have four out of, of six kids in our country. We have much more. According to the National Center of Fathering, there are 20 million kids wow. will go to bed right tonight in our country without a dad. Mm -hmm. How about all the dads who don't know how to be fathers? And so when these guys are playing, and the reason I wrote this letter wasn't to just jump in their grill and be political. I called them to stand up for five things in their life and their story. Mm -hmm. Instead of taking a knee, would you stand up with me? Because here's the deal. Their audience are these 20 million kids. These kids are not seeing these celebrities anymore as just celebrities or players with jerseys that they wear on. They, they seem like father figures. And so they're going to walk like them. They're going to talk like them. They're going to treat mm -hmm. girls the way they treat girls. I mean, look, look at the influences of our culture with young people today. Yeah. You can barely ever find, find a godly guy who's celebrated because he walks a righteous life. Remember Tim Tebow? Yeah. I mean, he got all kinds of flack in the media. Why? <laughs> this guy loved Jesus, stood up, modeled that, was still a virgin. <laughs> Can you imagine that, being a football player, being still a virgin? And he was proud of that in his life. I, I love the, the stand that he took as a player. Yeah. And so I call these guys, not to shame them, to say, hey, guys, do you realize and, and one of the couple of things I suggested to him, number one, be the kind of man or guy that every dad in America, every mom would say, could you be like him? Treat girls in such a way that moms and dads would be comfortable if you came over to date their daughter. Yeah. I mean, are you the kind of guy that could be there? Imagine one day you having a daughter would you allow you to date your daughter right now? So, Ed, you're talking about a much wider you live critique. That life. You're, you're really you're you're looking at something much wider than just the kneeling controversy, um, because it really what you're talking about is a whole lifestyle choice, a whole um, moral view of life, and your obligation in it as a role model. Do you believe these NFL players have a special responsibility, given their outsize influence, particularly in the inner city, in the so-called community that Goodell keeps talking about. And what would you suggest these men do, given that influence, particularly on young African-American and white men in these communities? You know, it's an amazing privilege to be able to play a game. They're not like Hollywood people who imitate life. Mm -hmm. They live a real life. Mm -hmm. And what, a, what an incredible um, responsibility and privilege that they, they have to do this. And see, so, see, so how are you going to be a man in your story if you've never had a father to show you how to do that? That's a dilemma of the world. And, you know, there, there's a verse in the Bible that really struck me a number of years ago, and it's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why we started Blessing of the Father Ministries and, and I'm doing what I'm doing. It's in the book of Lamentations. 5 verse 3 in the message translation and it's the song of so many kids today and a lot of adults who never had a dad and this is what it says orphans we are not a father in sight and our mothers are no better than widows hmm. that's what they're singing out there on the street that's what's coming out of so many protesters because i mean what would be different in the world if fathers were in the place that god had designed them to be and then celebrities, when they have that privilege, they, yeah. they understand that, wait a minute, they're getting all this money. Couldn't you Jen, understand that what you do and how you act will affect these kids? You know, Ed. Uh, and I know this as a fact as well. A lot of these guys are doing great things mm -hmm. in the city that you never really hear about. That's true. So I, I want to understand that. That's right. Well, I, I want to encourage them to do more. I mean, some of these men who are taking knees, if you really want to help 
in the community. You should do what one of the, the teams that I follow, uh, the Saints, Cameron Jordan, who's a, a Saints player, he made a literary stop this week. He went to schools encouraging kids to read. Many other, Drew Brees has foundation. I know many players have foundations where they try to mentor or reach out to kids. I met with uh, Matt Light, who's a former uh, Patriot this week. He's got an amazing foundation that mentors these young kids and keeps after them as they go through school, mentoring them, doing what a father would no normally do. Would you encourage players to do that sort of community outreach one-on-one -on -one rather than taking a knee before, during the national anthem or before it? You know, that's a no-brainer, absolutely. But you know, you got to understand this too. And I, my best friend in my life is African-American football player Brian Holloway. And I grew up with him in an all-white neighborhood. He was the only black family there. And I watched how he had to go through stuff. So I understand some of the hurt and some of the anger and some of the stuff. I, I, not quite like they do, but I understand where they come from. And, and I, I, I think it's important for them to stand up and really have a conversation about the things they feel. That's, that's the freedom that we have in our country to do, but not during the national anthem. Very good. Ed, I thank you so much for being here and for the good work you're doing. Um, we will stay in touch with you. If you'd like more on Ed's ministry, visit blessingsofthefather.com. When we return, over a decade ago, a trip to Africa radically changed my next guest's life. Katie Davis Majors talks about the experience in her new book, Daring to Hope, when the world over continues. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. When my next guest was just 18, she spent three weeks in Uganda during her senior year in high school. Little did she know the trip would change her life forever. After returning home to Tennessee, she decided to postpone college and move to Uganda to teach at an orphanage for girls. Her year-long commitment turned into a lifelong calling. I sat down with her recently to discuss her work and her new book, Daring to Hope, Finding God in the Broken and the Beautiful. Here's my interview with Katie Davis Majors. Katie, you make a decision to forego college. You, you, you go to Uganda. Why would you do that? I had been to Uganda on a short-term trip my senior year in high school, and I had been invited by a pastor there to come back and volunteer at his orphanage for a year. Mm. So after finishing high school, I decided just to defer college for a year and move to Uganda and spend that year volunteering. While I was there, though, I, I saw a lot of things that were very shocking to me. Immense poverty, for sure. But also, I found out that about 80% of children in Uganda who are living in institutions or orphanages mm -hmm. actually have at least one living parent. And so in Uganda, most orphanages are filled with children who are not unloved or unwanted, but are just very poor. Wow. And it's a way for them to eat. It's a way <clears throat> yeah, for them to be cared for. Yeah, their for parents to send them there so that they will be well taken care of, mm. so that someone will pay for them to go to school. School mm. is a huge cost to Ugandan mm. families. And I just, I wanted to do something to change that. And so I began asking community members that I had made friends with, if I would help pay for your children to go to school, maybe help with some food around the house, some of these basic costs, would you then want to keep your children? And unanimously, people said yes. Mm. So I began to send a couple of children from the community to school, paying mm. for their school fees with some of the support I had raised to live there. Mm. I began to share with my parents and some friends from back home what was going on and what I was seeing. And people said, oh, I could, I could give you some money to do that. I could help out mm. in that way. And before you know it, I was sending 40 kids from the local community huh. to school <laughs> yeah. and was developing relationships with them, teaching their parents about the Bible. And I thought, oh, I should probably give this a name. <laughs> yeah, and it was Amazima, Amazima Ministries. Yes. Yeah. And you, you found that in 2008, by the time you're 23 years old, you have 13 foster daughters. Yes. How did you, how did you go from helping these kids and trying to reconnect them with their families and get them food and schooling to actually fostering and then adopting 13 daughters? Yeah. 
So Amazima continued to grow and we had 40 and then 60 and then 100 children and we expanded until we have about 600 children today that we're sponsoring. Mm. And uh, over the course of that time, there were children that I was in relationship with through the ministry that for various tragic reasons didn't actually have a family member that they could stay with. Maybe they had lost all their living relatives, maybe their living relatives were dangerous. And so um, our children are five sibling groups mm. that all came to me and all of them, their situations were difficult. And so I said, oh, well, you can stay here for a little while <laughs> while we look and while we investigate the situation. And we've had lots and lots and lots of kids come through our home in that way mm. over the years. But for these 13, we were never able to find a safer, viable option for them to go back mm. into the community. And so I did begin the process to foster them long term, which eventually led to finalizing their adoptions. Wow. Now, yeah. you write in Daring to Hope in your new book that uh, you don't always get the ending mm. that you imagined or that you hoped for. What did you hope for? Because this was not an easy, this was not an easy thing. Uh, adopting these these 13 girls and building this ministry. There are a lot of challenges. What did you hope for? What did you find? Yeah, um, there are several stories in Daring to Hope that that I share of, of personally what I felt like were kind of unanswered prayers. We also mm -hmm. get the privilege of caring for a lot of hurting people in our mm -hmm. home, whether that's somebody who's in between jobs and, and homeless for a season. Maybe that's somebody who's very, very ill and needs mm -hmm. consistent access to the hospital, which our house is situated close to the local hospital. And so as we've cared for these people, we've prayed a lot of things for them. You know, we've prayed healing over them and we've prayed restoration. And sometimes God has granted that. And we've yeah. been able to see these people onto a joyful new part of their future. Sometimes we have prayed and asked for those things and they haven't come. I have, I have prayed for people to be healed and they have still died and gone on to eternity with Jesus. And so I think that really started for me this process of wrestling with, okay, God, I've always believed that you are a good and loving and faithful mm -hmm. God, but how could you be loving when suffering is so present in the world and so I feel like I saw that my hope was maybe not true hope maybe it was more of kind of a naive optimism mm -hmm. where I was looking for just a happy ending or just things to go to go the way that I wanted them to go and instead God has showed me that true hope is looking to him no matter what the situation is and trusting and believing that he might not give us what we're asking for, but he is going to give us what we need. Mm -hmm. And he is going to be present with us to get us through all circumstances. But it was a personal crisis of faith. I mean, there are moments in here where you really struggle. Absolutely. Um, particularly, there was a situation about uh, one of the, the daughters that you were trying to adopt and you lose her. Yes. Tell me about that situation and what it brought you to appreciate. Yeah. Like I mentioned, we had fostered children temporarily right. very often with the hopes of placing them back in their families, and that's mm -hmm. something that our ministry is really geared toward. But with Jane, we had she had been abandoned when she was a baby and had been brought to me. Mm -hmm. We had advertised in the newspaper and on the radio trying to find family for her, and no one had come forward. So I had begun the long-term foster care process and was almost done with the three years required by Uganda before you can finalize an adoption. Adoption. Mm. And just toward the end of that three years, when our paperwork was almost final, her biological mom came forward and expressed a desire to parent Jane. And mm. so, of course, that wasn't that wasn't what we had been expecting. I hadn't ever gone through in my mind the, the thought of resettlement with her. And so it was devastating to me and even mm. to her sisters, to, to my other girls. We were devastated by the loss of this child from our family. And I, I feel like I really got to experience God's presence and mm -hmm. his peace, even in the midst of that very, very Suffering. difficult hardship. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, in 2015, you marry. Yes. You're a special guy. Yeah. I mean, uh, did you ever think you'd meet somebody who would welcome a, fa a pre-made family this large, 13 girls and a wife? You know, I didn't. That was kind of a dream that I thought, oh. Well, it would be nice to be married, but, but I guess maybe it's not in the cards for me. Yeah. And he's a, a missionary yes. as well? Yeah. Oh, so that worked out well. Yeah. And now you have two more? 
Just one more. Just one more. Yeah. So it's 14 now. 14 now. Oh. So we had we had our son about a year and a half ago now. What has been your impact not only on the volunteers because it seems they're very open to adopting, but Ugandan culture did not. It is not a culture that necessarily was open to adoption. It's really just not in the in the in the culture. Have you changed things at all or seen an impact? Yeah, I really think we have. I think the Ugandan culture is very gracious and very hospitable by nature, but poverty makes it very hard mm. to welcome other children into your home. And so um, it is in the culture to welcome people in, but people find it very hard. And, and the word adoption isn't really a term that is used, but um, we've had about seven staff members, Ugandan staff members mm -hmm. that are working for Amazima, our ministry organization, who have adopted and fostered children from the community. And people ask me now sometimes, well, do you think you'll ever adopt again? And I, I mean, I always say we would be open to it if we felt like the Lord made it very clear, mm -hmm. but we have seen an uprising of Ugandan people in our community who are open to fostering and who are open to adoption. And so mm -hmm. The last many children who I have fostered who we haven't been able to find um, a biological family placement for have actually gone on to be fostered mm -hmm. by Ugandan community members. Yeah. Katie, so many people that will read this book, they'll never go to Uganda. They'll really never understand the poverty or the hardship mm -hmm. in many cases that you're dealing with and that you deal with on a daily basis. Why did you want them to understand this story? And what do you hope they'll take from it and incorporate into their own lives? I really hope it's it's a relatable story because, yeah, your life might not look the same as mine. I, I live in Uganda. I have a huge family. That's not mm -hmm. everybody's story, nor should it be. But I think suffering is part of life. It's You see suffering in your face in Uganda. Suffering is in your face here. I think all of us know what it is to see a dream fade away or a plan that we had be laid aside. All of us experience loss and tragedy of some kind, and I just really wanted to write it to encourage people. No temptation to come back to the United States? No. No? No. You wouldn't dream of bringing them back? No, no. Why? Uganda is our home. I really. Um, what is it about Uganda that, because I, I have to tell you, I read about all the hardship and I'm amazed at what you've done there. Oh. I also, oh. in some ways, couldn't imagine going down that path and particularly having lived in, look, luxury compared to the rest sure. of the world. Yeah. We are, yeah. blessed are blessed in a way that you don't appreciate until you experience some of the rest that of the world. That is very true. But having been on both sides of that, why wouldn't you want to come back and bring your children back to the plenty that is America? Yeah. I feel like God has work for us there, and I think there is something very satisfying and very joyful about knowing that you're doing what God has asked you to do. And I can't really, I can't really imagine trading that for mm. just to be somewhere a little more comfortable. And I also, I really value raising our children up in their culture. Um, we. We are now a, a family of blended culture, but we get to experience their culture in a very rich way, which I think mm. is important for them. No, I love that. What I loved about the book is your openness to go where God calls you and stay there. Mm, and that's you. a hard thing to, that's a hard thing to do. It's easy to say, hard to do. Yeah. And I love that you're doing it and showing others how to do the same. Well, Thank thanks. you for being here. Daring to Hope, Finding God in the Broken and the Beautiful by Katie Davis Majors is available at bookstores everywhere and online. That is all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to join us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.